Good afternoon to you all. Of South Nansha do not target or impact any country, and China does not intend to pursue militarization, said the statements. As we know, since 2016, uh, the statement uh, I just read was published in 2015, China has been expanding continuously its military presence in the South China Sea especially around the Scarborough Shoal, which is claimed by both China and the Philippines. But the latter has been present for um, many years. In 2016, a permanent court of arbitration in The Hague, in the Netherlands, ruled that China's expansion had no basis under international law uh, to, to uh, occupy uh, these islands. We have watched since countless actions by, by uh, Chinese coast guards and uh, vessels against Filipino vessels particularly. But President Marcos, the current president of the Philippines, has reacted strongly uh, among different things uh, by um, strengthening ties with the United States. Meanwhile, in the Korean Peninsula, uh, relations between uh, Seoul and Pyongyang have deteriorated um, furthermore over the past uh, five years. North Korea's nuclear and ballistic programs are on the rise, threatening peace in Northeast Asia. A redistribution of cards uh, has taken place with North Korea under Kim Jong-un getting closer to Russia and, of course, to China, but they have been close to China for a long time. While South Korea has started a rapprochement with uh, Japan under the auspices of the Biden administration. And uh, we will not talk too much in this debate about the situation in the Taiwan Straits, but we could. We will not talk about uh, the, the um, East China Sea between Japan and, uh, and China, we, but we could. Um, and uh, we will um, just uh, scratch the surface, as one says, because there's so much to say about this region and about uh, this topic. My name is Philippe Lecour. I'm a professor of geopolitics at ESSEC Business School, and I'm also a senior fellow with the, the Asia Society, which is a, a global organization uh, based in, in the US, but with 16 centers around the world, including one in the Philippines and one in Korea. So I'm glad to have my colleagues. We, I will introduce all of them very soon, and I'm so delighted to moderate this debate with a stellar panel. And thank you very much for being here. So let me introduce them in, in uh, since they are a stellar panel, in order of appearance. Ambassador Delia Albert, uh, sitting in, in the middle, is a former Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, of the Philippines, um, and a former chairperson of the United Nations Security Council, and also Director General of ASEAN. Who, who knows what ASEAN is? Raise your hands. 
Right, so we've got some work, you know, we've got some work, Delia. Um, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. So you're lucky to have the former Director General of ASEAN. She can tell you a great deal about it. Sitting next to me, Professor Yeon Jung Lim. Thank you for, for being here. Um, uh, Yeon Jung is a professor of international relations at Kongju University in Korea, in the Republic of Korea, and an expert of uh, uh, regional issues and also uh, relations between uh, the United States and, um, and Northeast Asia. And last but not least, uh, Dr. Bates Gill, uh, who has held numerous um, uh, positions um, in Asia, in the United States, in Australia, in Europe, running multiple think tanks and academic organizations, all related to Asia, um, to security. He's the author of many books, and um, uh, he's currently a senior fellow with the National Bureau of Asian Research, among many other uh, positions. So the way it's going to work, uh, I'm going to, introdu I'm going to uh, ask uh, uh, Ambassador Albert first, then uh, Dr. Lim and, and Dr. Bates, and then uh, we'll keep some time for questions uh, from uh, the room. Uh, but first, we're going to have a little debate among ourselves. And um, we have a few slides. And I will start with um, Ambassador Albert and um, I will start showing uh, the slides whenever you tell me you're ready. Please, Delia. Bonjour. That's uh, a little French that I learned when I arrived. Uh, I'm glad to be here. And yesterday I was a tourist. I went to the Caen Memorial Museum. And in the museum, I saw the effect of the war on Cannes and in Europe. In the same museum, I saw the impact of the war in the Asia Pacific. The Philippines was greatly devastated by Second World War. And in history, it's the second most destructed city in World War II after Warsaw. It made me think how wars are really madness. And I hope that the museum will give the young people, and also not so young people like us, the warning that we should never do it again. It had a great impact on me because I know what war meant to my country in the Philippines, and I saw how devastated Ken was during the Second World War. So for that, as the introduction, uh, I would like perhaps tomorrow to visit the other places in Normandy, because when I told my friends I was coming to France and I was coming to Normandy, Everybody know, knew about Omaha and all those uh, places that are historically known around the world. But to learn from wars, I think it's important for us to know about the world, how the world is behaving, how we are relating to the rest of the world. I think and I thought that uh, I would introduce you to a part of the world where I come from, and it is a very active region uh, in Southeast Asia, and I think the map is being shown. Just to let you know where I come from, I'm the pink country in the middle between the Philippine Sea on the right and South China Sea on the left. This is my region. It is a very uh, progressive area because we were able to keep the peace for the past years since the end of World War II. 
Now, this area of Southeast Asia today is one of the leading economic progressive regions. Why? I think because we were able to maintain the peace and we always thought with peace come prosperity. And um, after the war, countries around neighborhood of the Philippines, there are 10 of us, decided that in order to promote peace in the region and ensure prosperity, we should form a group of countries called ASEAN, A-S-E-A-N. It's the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. And uh, if I will believe the Japanese newspaper yesterday, they said that in less than 10 years, we will overcome total GNP of China, which was a big news for me because I, I underestimated the progress of that region. Now, on the map, you see the 10 countries of ASEAN. Do you remember the countries in ASEAN? You must try to think in terms of the alphabet. How did ASEAN come about? It was first formed by five countries, the Philippines, Thailand, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore. When we got, our leaders got together in 1967, we felt that as neighbors, we should look after each other. We had enough uh, problems with the Second World War, and now we were on the path of making sure that the economies will grow, and economies will grow only if there's peace in the region. So after the five countries got together, other countries in the region decided to join us. For example, Brunei, which became a part of ASEAN two years after its independence. After Brunei came Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, and Myanmar. So this now today are the 10 countries that form ASEAN. We were very active in getting together, getting to know each other, but I think no other region in the world is so diverse as ASEAN. You have Christians in the Philippines, you have the biggest Muslim country in Indonesia, you have the Buddhists in uh, the mainland uh, Asia, of Thailand, Cambodia, and Laos, and all other, uh, indigenous religions. So you can imagine the diversity in our region. But there's one thing that perhaps I forgot to show you, what makes us get together and what makes us form a good organization together. And if you know the symbol of ASEAN, it's 10 rice stalks. Um, sorry, I was not in the picture. Ten rice stalks because all of us eat rice three times a day. And other countries who wanted to join us said, sorry, you don't eat rice as much as we do. But perhaps the symbol of rice is what keeps us together as a group. And over the years, we are now 57 years old. We have become so linked together and became known, not as ASEAN, Association of Southeast Asian Stat Nations, but people call us the Association of Energetic and Ambitious Nations. Perhaps that's a nicer way to remember uh, ASEAN. So how did ASEAN develop and why is peace pervasive in our region. We decided that in order to keep peace, we have to relate with our neighbors. 
we have different ways of linking with our neighbors. And one of our first uh, neighboring country that uh, joined us as a dialogue partner was Australia. At the same time that Australia became a dialogue partner, what is a dialogue partner? It's a country that is interested to do not just political activities, but mainly economic activities with us, as well as to build up more linkages between the two countries. At the same time that Australia became our uh, dialogue partner, the EU, the European Union, decided to join us. So both Australia and the EU became the first dialogue partners of ASEAN. So when you talk about ASEAN 10, it means the 10 member countries of ASEAN. And when you talk about ASEAN and its dialogue partners, you have more than uh, 10 Mem uh, member countries that are our dialogue partners. That includes not only Australia, Canada, China, European Union, India, Japan, New Zealand, Korea, of course, Russian Federation, United Kingdom, and the United States. I have to emphasize that this is a very unique feature of ASEAN. And this has kept us in our um, relationship with the rest of the world, in not just a small group of 10 countries, but we are linked through our dialogue partnership with other countries. One thing that I think was very important with us is to be able to get our big partners like China, Japan, and Korea to be part of our dialogue partners and became a very important and play a very important role in our political discourse in Asia today. Then we have the sectoral partners. These are countries who decided to be part of our um, meetings, part of our projects, part of our wider circle of friends around the world. I think this is a unique feature of ASEAN which no other international organization of this size has maintained such a relationship globally. And then we all have our regional partners in Latin America who also are interested in us because we are, as I said earlier, I think uh, they think and we believe we are such an energetic and ambitious nations. So, those are the features of ASEAN, which I'm very, very uh, proud of because it has kept peace in the region and it has kept uh, some level of prosperity in our part of the world. Now, earlier we heard about the uh, issues with our neighbors in the region, especially a big neighbor next door. Uh, the Philippines being an archipelago is like Indonesia. Uh, we are called the maritime ASEAN. We share a link to other bodies of water in our area. One of them, of course, is the South China Sea. Now, the South China Sea is a huge body of water that is one of the most important uh, bodies of water for trade relations between Asia, Europe, and the rest of the world. One third of global trade goes through the South China Sea. So we believe that we should keep the South China Sea, we should maintain the freedom of navigation so that countries that will deal with, with not just the ASEAN countries, but with the countries of, of uh, Korea, Japan, Taiwan, will be able to uh, move freely. 
However, uh, as suggested and as mentioned earlier, one country in the region in 1947 decided to draw a nine dash line uh, that will incorporate most of the South China Sea. I think you will see the map. Uh, that's the body of water that is today one of the issues of contention. If you look at the sea carefully, you will see the red lines that have been put there since 1947 by China. And all the, all the body of water within that line is claimed by China, which of course we do not agree. We believe that this is an open sea and it should be open to everybody who would like to deal with our region and the region north of us, which includes Taiwan, Korea, and Japan. So in, uh, before 19, uh, 2016, there were uh, Filipino fishermen who were being disallowed from fishing in the open sea. Many times they were sent back and not allowed to go into the, this is one of the best fishing grounds in Asia, where you find, uh, this is where the fish breed to multiply, and therefore a very important source of uh, life for all of us in the region. However, in 2012, our ships, our fishermen were told to stay away and the Philippines decided, we are a small country, we cannot fight a big country, we should go to a court. The court of arbitration in The Hague. We brought our case to The Hague and we said, look, please decide about this nine dash line that has been set up by China. In 2016, after three, four years of court uh, proceedings, the International Arbitration Court decided that there is no such thing as a nine dash line. It does not exist. And therefore, we should be free to make use of it, not just for us, but other countries of the world that trade with us. So if you read newspapers today or if you watch television and news, you will hear the Nandaish line which was put there by China and which we have brought them to court against and won the case that it does not exist. However, China does not, uh, did not want to respect the court decision and that's where we have this issue. Meantime, the Philippines, which was a colony of the United States in 1898 after the second, after uh, Spanish-American War, established in the Philippines its presence. And during the Cold War, we signed an agreement with the United States that whatever happens to the Philippines is also a responsibility of the United States. So that's why the United States is engaged in this current situation. So I think that should give us some idea of where we are, where we have been, and we, where we want to go to. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you very much, Delia. It was extremely... <laughs> for for these young people to hear all, this, all these details about history, about a region they would not hear about on a daily basis, I think is extremely valuable. And let, let, let me just add uh, uh, that it's, it's not only the Philippines that wants free freedom of navigation, it's also uh, other countries that appear on this map, including Malaysia, Brunei, Vietnam, 
um, the island of Taiwan, which I'm sure uh, uh, Bates will, will allude to. Um, and, and so, and, and, and the, the second thing is that the, the People's Republic of China in Beijing does not uh, recognize this uh, international arbitration courts. Therefore, it, it says that it is not tied to the decisions. Uh, by the way, the United States sometimes also doesn't agree with certain decisions of other courts uh, because it also doesn't feel part of it. So, you know, that's another matter, uh, you know, international law. But let me move to uh, your neighbor, Dr. Lim, and, and uh, <laughs> welcome to this panel and welcome to, to Caen. And perhaps we could um, um, now move a little bit um, uh, north of Asia and um, talking about this idea of uh, regional alliances and Quite a lot has been happening, really, uh, over the past few years. You have a f relatively new president, President Yoon, um, who has different policies from his predecessors, um, but also the uh, relations with the United States, with Japan, and also with China are of utmost importance to the Republic of Korea. So please. Okay, thank you. Again, bonjour everyone. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Again, as introduced, my name is Eun Jung Lim. I'm from South Korea, not North, <laughs> actually. Actually, somebody else was joking with me, and uh, you must be um, part of Kim family. Or also, you, uh, you know, it was a bad joke. <laughs> I, I felt like, you know, this is pretty offensive <laughs> to me. But anyhow, I'm from South, Southern part of the uh, Korean Peninsula, and I'm teaching at uh, uh, one national university of the country. And this is my great honor and opportunity, pleasure to be here. And this is my ever first time to be in Kong and Normandy. Uh, but I went to the beach actually this very early in the morning because absolutely, I, as an um, international political scientist, um, you know, we all know the, how, how important the Normandy uh, landing was. And similarly, um, again, the Incheon landing uh, was a game changer uh, during the Korean War. So I see some kind of parallels between the um, here and my own country. So I went up there and I'm so glad to see all of you, again, the young, young people, I mean, who are very serious uh, and uh, discussing about, again, the peace. Because today, uh, all around the world, again, the yesterday, for example, I enjoyed the plenary session a lot. But we have so many problems all around the world. Relatively speaking, my region, uh, Northeast Asia, looks okay, even though North is like that, <laughs> North Korea is still like that. But still, it's uh, pretty much under control, I hope. But these days, more and more, um, unexpected, uh, I will call um, academically emerging security issue, such as, uh, for example, cyber um, attack or like uh, space issues or, or whatever those, you know, deep fake crimes are really um, increasing seriously in Korea as well. And North Korea's cyber attacks are getting more and more increasingly sophisticated. So we have um, dealing with all these emerging security issues, but um, before I uh, go to that more like the newer topics, um, you know, let me just take this opportunity and I'd like to highlight uh, several blood points from my country's history because it is a, uh, I think, important part of the global human history. Because Korea, again, as you, we all know, is divided, um, the peninsula is divided. And when I taught actually Korean politics in the United States, um, you know, I told my American students, if you study Korean history, I think uh, you can understand any part of the world because basically we experienced everything. Again, the Korea used to be a colony of Imperial Japan, but later on we experienced a civil war which is um, international war too, civil war slash international war. Um, so we fought, killed each other over for, for three years, but it didn't actually solve any problem and still the peninsula is remained divided and a lot of tension is there. And we experienced developmental dictatorship, again, the General Park, killed many people. Of course, I do, um, you know, appreciate some policy outcomes um, of General Park. However, at the same time, he was, he was a brutal dictator. Uh, we can't deny the fact. 
So we did have uh, at least uh, three dictators, and, and then we experienced a 19 years long, again, the dictatorship, so-called the developmental dictatorship. Um, under that, of course, we accomplished industrialization, but at the same time, so many people die. Um, so we experienced that, and we experienced the uh, so-called bottom-up democratization. Again, this whole society um, was democratized by people's power, just like a French experience. And in 1987, um, we experienced that. Um, but ever since then, um, you know, we still, the whole society is pretty much divided, polarized, just like an American society. You know, part of the reason is, of course, um, because of the structure. Again, the presidential system is easily pushes the parties into the two polar. So we have a very polarized two party. They never agree on anything. So we have very polarized system, but it is deeply related to the divided situations of the peninsula. So because our nationalism or how we see our history, how we see the future of the country, it is all related to how we see, again, the North. And of course, so-called progressive people, uh, which can be regarded as more ethnically nationalistic, so-called pan-Koreanist. You know, from their point of view, definitely North is our brother. Um, and we, we have to, we have to just restore the relationship, da-da-da. But on the other hand, the conservative, um, like the current, again, the ruling party or the, the present Yoon, from their point of view, again, the, we are very different people. Again, even though ethnicity um, remains identical, however, as long as we fought for freedom or we fought um, for the uh, um, better society or we accomplished industrialization with the blood, Again, if so, we can't, you know, we can't be that much compromisable with the other, again, the Korea, again, the North. So their view is pretty hawkish um, toward the, uh, um, the North. Again, the both coexist together. We don't kill each other within the country. However, verbally or sometimes physically, we fight very, very seriously. Um, so this is getting worse and worse, and North, their provocation is very much more tight-dimensional. Again, they do have a nuclear program, which is directly related to non-proliferation regime, global non-proliferation regime. And at the same time, of course, they do have a missile programs, or they do have, as I mentioned, cyber, and they are now very much close to Russia, uh, President Putin, and they are trying to uh, polish their space technology too, which is deeply related to the cyber, cyber technology as well. Or they, have you, have you ever heard of dirty balloons? I mean, they are, yeah, they <laughs> every day that's happening. Every day they send the garbages, or I don't want to even mention what, what was in there, but you know, so-called dirty balloons every other day is coming. So, well, for now, I mean, it's just dirty balloons, but what if in the future, if they send us something very dangerous, I mean, within the balloon, it's a pretty sophisticated, actually, technology. You know, I don't want to go to, you know, too much, uh, too deep um, with the uh, Middle East issue because we are focusing on now Asia. But, you know, Hamas is that tactics are pretty much, you know, similar uh, with the North because North actually they did with the parachute or all these unconventional skills. It's tunnel too. We still, you know, if you come to my country, you can see the tunnel, how close it was to, to the middle of the soul. So what I'm trying to say is, um, even though uh, we are from the same history, same um, ethnic origins or same history, we share the languages. However, um, you know, what they are doing to us is becoming more and more outrageous and we definitely need support. Support from all around the world. ASEAN is definitely important. US is, of course, 
um, you know, our alliance and uh, definitely. So having had all this, you know, idea, um, current um, rapprochement, I, I, the, the rapprochement between my country and Japan is not complete yet, like a Franco-German uh, rapprochement. I think we still have a lot of issues uh, which can be pretty much volatile um, at some point. However, I want to remain optimistic as much as I can because the new leaderships, um, and as you probably heard again uh, just a few hours ago, the Japan's uh, Liberal Democratic Party, the ruling party, um, they chose the uh, Mr. Ishiba as the new president, which means he's gonna be um, appointed as the new prime minister of Japan. But Ishiba, uh, Mr. Ishiba is uh, more like a pretty reasonable politician. So I want to remain optimistic uh, about the Japan's leadership. But both society, I think, Korea, South Korea, and, and the Japanese society, we gradually we realize that, again, that this is not the time for us to fight uh, over and over and over. Um, because, you know, look at the war, all around the world, there are two wars, um, literally, ongoing, and there's so many difficult emerging security issues, humanitarian crisis, so again, that this is not the right time for Korea, South Korea, and Japan to fight over the past issue. So that is why um, I think we were able to make a uh, um, kind of, you know, kind of, quasi semi uh, rapprochement last year. Um, of course, it was more like a top-down. President Yoon and the Prime Minister Kishida, um, basically, they really took the initiative. But I think, um, as I just mentioned, it can be more sustainable because of all this, you know, external situations. Again, lastly, with the China, uh, which is, I think, one of our main focuses, Again, um, PRC used to be our enemy <laughs> because they, they crossed Yaru River and they, they joined the war. And if you see the armistice agreement um, of the uh, Korean War, you know, Chinese actually general commander, um, actually people's volunteer army, <laughs> volunteer here, there are a lot of things actually to talk, but anyhow, time-wise, I'm gonna <laughs> skip that, but anyhow, the commander of People's Volunteer Army, Peng Dohe, he signed, and Kim, again, the North says Kim signed, and then UN Commander Clark signed. So basically, these three parties agreed on the uh, armistice, um, so which means, again, back then, PRC um, was literally our enemy. However, no, not any longer, of course, no. We have you know, great and very deep, extensive economic relationship. And when we are trying to deal with North Korean issue, I can't think we can solve this problem without China's support. Of course, Japan's support is necessary. Of course, Russia's understanding is necessary. America's support, mandatory. However, again, the China is, is really key, key, key player um, who uh, should make a better um, efforts, I think, um, in the solving the North Korea problem. Um, so yeah, um, again, even though the US-China strategic rivalry is going on, we understand where this is from, and I think it's gonna take a while for, it's gonna take a for a while because it is basically about the future technology. Um, it is not literally a, a war, but it is more about the hegemony um, surrounding the future technology. So um, the US-China rivalry, I think it will continue for a while. However, at the same time, I want to see more dialogues absolutely between um, Seoul and Beijing or between the Beijing and Tokyo or between the Beijing and Pyongyang even or Beijing and then Washington too because we do have a real threat um, in the peninsula and without um, peace in the Korean Peninsula, I can't think we can see the real peace in the Northeast Asia. And if we don't see real peace in the Northeast Asia as a whole, um, it cannot be um, peaceful. So please, I mean, 
um, pay more attention uh, to my region too. And I'm looking forward to the further discussion with other panelists and with you too. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Yuan Jun. So it's really a chance to hear, you know, uh, about these parts of the world, which, you know, again, uh, we don't cover well enough in this country, even though unless you're very specialized. But uh, thank you for this very uh, the big picture uh, and, and, and historical uh, details about the Korean Peninsula. And I'm now turning to uh, uh, Bates Gill, and who is going to. Uh, uh, wrap up this, this panel, this regional panel. Of course, we'll come back with more questions. But obviously, there is one thing, I mean, Bates, that I would like perhaps you to, to, to refer to is the fact we've got U.S. elections coming uh, in, in, in about a month, uh, five weeks. And this, this will have an impact. It, in fact, the U.S. elections, as we know, I mean, there was a panel on the U.S. yesterday, um, it will have an, a worldwide impact. But perhaps you could tell us first how you see the, the state of alliances in Asia, in this region, but also what the role for the United States and how, uh, how important the region is for the United States in this region, which we now call the Indo-Pacific. Merci bien, Philippe. C'est un plaisir, c'est un honneur d'être uh, ici. Thank you, Philippe. It's an honor, a pleasure to be here. It's my first time here in Normandy, even though my ancestors, my ancestors were from Normandy a long time ago. But thank you very much, Philippe. Thank you to the forum to give me the opportunity to talk to talk uh, with you today. Thank you uh, very much. But I think it's better now to continue in English. So my role, as Philip said, is to try to offer a, uh, an American, um, one American's point of view on uh, the issue of alliances, security, and peace in Asia. Um, in my view, uh, we are in an increasingly uh, difficult increasingly tense uh, and, and in that sense quite crucial turning point for U.S. relations and alliances in the Indo-Pacific, uh, all of which uh, I think in mostly negative ways uh, affect the prospects for peace and security in the Indo-Pacific for, uh, for the coming era. I want to talk about three important uh, issues that I think define this turning point. First, as has already been mentioned, uh, quite seriously rising concerns, certainly within the United States and amongst American allies and friends in the, in the Indo-Pacific, rising concerns about China, uh, 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 but increasingly also about Russia and North Korea, and interestingly, deepening cooperation amongst the three of them together uh, at political, uh, economic, and importantly, military areas. Um, this raises many new, many new concerns and tensions into the U.S. alliance system with rising expectations on U.S. allies in the region, such as the Philippines, such as Japan, such as uh, South Korea, uh, to uh, work more closely with the United States and other friendly countries and partners to try and counterbalance what has become an increasingly challenging environment, uh, and especially in terms of China's more proactive, uh, often quite uh, even hostile activities uh, in the region. Um, of particular concern, as we've already heard, are China's uh, rising ambitions in the South China Sea, uh, across the Taiwan Strait, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the democratic island and self-governing island of Taiwan, uh, and also its growing nuclear capabilities, both of China and 
as Professor Lim already mentioned, also that of North Korea. So point one, uh, these countries of the region, like China and North Korea, but also partnering with others like Russia, uh, are becoming an increasing challenge and threat uh, to the interests and values of, of the United States, as well as its uh, partners in the region. Just a quick aside about alliances, if I may, Philippe. What do we mean by alliance? The word gets used a lot. Uh, and, and my view of what an alliance is, is a treaty-based formal agreement between two or more states uh, to assist one another in defense, primarily, uh, in case of uh, a war or a conflict were to break out. Uh, we have, the United States has such treaties with Japan, with South Korea, with the Philippines, uh, and Thailand, and Australia uh, in the Indo-Pacific, as of course the United States does, as you all well know, uh, under the uh, NATO arrangements. So that's what I'm talking about um, when I speak about alliances. So that's the first point. The U.S. alliance system is coming under increasing pressure from these outside forces as they, as China, North Korea, and others pursue their interests in the region. Secondly, what's been the response by, by the United States and its allies and other security-related partners? First, a much uh, more proactive effort to deepen and strengthen those critical bilateral alliances that I just mentioned, those five important bilateral alliances of the United States in the Indo-Pacific. But second, in addition, uh, efforts are underway to establish new forms of partnerships, not formal alliances, but nevertheless new forms of partnerships which create additional uh, defense and military related um, counterbalancing uh, toward China and even uh, North Korea. What am I talking about? Maybe many of you have heard about the Australia, United Kingdom, United States Agreement, so-called AUKUS, A-U-K-U-S, uh, which is primarily a, 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 an undertaking to deepen defense technology cooperation across those three countries. It's going to have its largest impact in um, the defense-related dynamics within the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, the United States has brokered a deepening of cooperation amongst the three partners, United States, Japan, and South Korea, in a courageous, I think, courageous, uh, politically courageous undertaking by the leaders of South Korea and Japan to try and overcome their historical uh, and other political differences so that the three, United States, Japan, and South Korea, can work more closely uh, with one another across a range of issues. Um, and not just amongst, U it's not just US-led efforts. Uh, other allies are beginning to work more closely with one another without the United States around defense technology and training uh, and uh, joint exercises. So Japan and the Philippines, for example, Australia, and the Philippines, Australia and Japan, all working more closely uh, together. Um, so US officials like to refer to this undertaking as a lattice, or in uh, français, uh, a tria. Tria? Tria? Uh, a trio. A trio. trio. So a, 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 an interweaving of the various partnerships across the region which, in theory, will make uh, those uh, partnerships more, uh, more, more powerful and more effective. So these are two interesting dynamics, right? On the one hand, you have, a, as I just mentioned, a, a more ambitious and proactive China and North Korea uh, seeking to alter the security dynamic in the region to push back against the United States and its allies. But on the other hand, you have uh, United States and its allies also working to counterbalance that. You know, that's not th that may not be a recipe for peace in the future. Uh, both sides see this as an effort to deter the other. And of course that can lead to conflict uh, if it's not properly managed.
going forward. Now, the third important uh, issue that I think creates a turning point or a crucial pivot moment for the region, of course, is what uh, Philippe has already mentioned, and that's the upcoming U.S. Uh, election. Um, I, I don't think we can predict with a lot of certainty of what the outcome is going to be. It is going to be extremely close outcome. Uh, it will definitely involve that odd mechanism of American electoral politics known as the Electoral College. Uh, it uh, may result, it may result in a situation where uh, one, one of the uh, uh, candidates will win a majority of the vote, but will not win the election. Something similar to what happened in 2016 uh, when President Trump uh, uh, was victorious, even though he did not have the majority of the people's votes. So I can't predict what will happen. But at best, as analysts trying to understand the future, we can try to think about what one administration versus the other might do. Um, in the case of the Trump uh, team, maybe it's somewhat easier. I, I guess in, in, in both cases, it's somewhat easier as an analyst to, to predict because we've seen both of them uh, in action. We, we have a pretty good idea of what their policies have already been, and we can assume they will be similar going forward. Uh, a, a Trump administration, though, I think is still somewhat uncertain. Even within the Trump team, within the Trump, uh, you know, those persons who we believe will be the senior most uh, uh, important advisors to President Trump, there are deep divides about uh, relationships with American allies uh, and the degree to which the United States should continue to play this major security role uh, internationally, whether that's in Europe, or in the Indo-Pacific. So it's a little bit hard to predict, but I think one thing for sure when it comes to alliances is that alliance partners will, more will be asked of them. More will be asked of them, uh, both in terms of financial commitments to their own defense, uh, but also to uh, uh, you know, do more to push back uh, and, and help the United States uh, defend its interests in the region. Uh, a Harris administration um, is also likely, I think, to be uh, hawkish toward China, um, continuing uh, what President Biden has been pursuing, not only in terms of trying to strengthen alliance relationships in the region, but also um, delivering more punitive measures against China, economically speaking. Uh, as a tool to try and um, uh, assure that China's uh, military industrial power does not too rapidly grow counter to American interests. Um, again, I, I think a Harris administration will also make demands upon its allies in the region and have quite high expectations that they take similar measures to try and counterbalance China. So either way, I, I think uh, American allies in the region um, will find that the next administration will be making greater demands upon them, especially in terms of their relationship with China and towards North Korea. For me, then, it all adds up to seeing increasing tensions uh, in, in the region, I do not see a, a, a likelihood that U.S.-China relations will improve significantly in the coming years, no matter who is a president. And, um, of course, around certain quite volatile issues, like across the Taiwan Strait, uh, the possibility of uh, confrontation and, and possibly even conflict, I think, are as high uh, for this region, uh, especially in, in terms of U.S.-China relations, as they've been in 50 or 60 years or more. Uh, I think the real question then is the degree to which the two sides can manage their relationship. Yes, both are going to make an effort to deter the other, uh, but I think it's going to require an enormously more skillful and careful uh, strategic approach by both China 
and the United States and their partners in the region to make sure that we avoid the worst outcomes for this region. Thank you very much, Bates. Uh, I suggest if, if you have questions, you can start raising your hands and we can have a first round of questions. If not, I have plenty of questions, but let's, let's get started, maybe this gentleman here. Uh, can we have a mic, please? No, 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 it's better because uh, it's all been uh, recorded, so just hold on. Good afternoon. Uh, I should Close to the microphone, please. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you for your presentations. Uh, I have a pretty simple question about uh, the region, uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, sorry, I should present myself. I'm a student uh, in a master's degree in global diplomacy, so I'm really interested in those questions. So I would like to know a, li a little bit more about the Asian, uh, the Asian uh, countries, um, are they going to join maybe AUKUS and all the alliance, or are they not, because of the tied up uh, relation with China? Or, um, and also, I have another question, really different uh, for you professors, uh, about the demographic, um, the, the influence of different demography uh, in the relation in the region. Because I know it's a basic question, but it's really important, I think. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Delia, would you like to take the, the first question? Yeah, thank you for your question. Now, AUKUS was really a uh, Australian-US-UK um, partnership or agreement where the Australians uh, are working on the uh, transfer of nuclear technology on nuclear-powered submarines. Uh, not nuclear, nuclear power, but nuclear-powered submarines. Now, the Philippines doesn't have submarines of that uh, level, and I don't think we are, uh, we will be part of AUKUS. Although, AUKUS has an impact on the current situation because we have a treaty agreement with the US and we have a treaty agreement with, uh, with uh, 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 Australia. And uh, we have a very strong uh, agreement, defense cooperation agreement with Australia. So that's on AUKUS. Uh, you may be interested that there's another uh, important group that is uh, actively working in the region, is the Quad. It's uh, Japan. Uh, the U.S., uh, Australia, and India. And uh, it's very interesting because uh, <clears throat> I, I just came from India to visit the Dalai Lama, and it's wonderful to see how a man like him talks about peace and how positive he is about peace and uh, all that. But at the same time, India has a uh, very strong stake in the region. In the same way that they have a border problem with uh, China in the northern part, uh, India looks at us uh, as a uh, friendly uh, country because we have very good uh, economic relations with India. So Quad has some kind of influence in terms of their participation with ASEAN. But ASEAN is not a member of Quad, it's not a member of AUKUS. But uh, we were referring earlier to Indo-Pacific. The Indo-Pacific concept was uh, brought about by a desire to link, uh, mainly economically, uh, <coughs> the uh, countries from uh, Japan all the way to India. This is a very interesting development because in the early days, India was not part of the equation. But now it is, and because it has uh, strong relations with ASEAN, uh, we have a, uh, a kind of a defense cooperation agreement with them. And so we are all interested to see how this uh, partnership under the uh, Indo-Pacific uh, arrangement is 
concern. Uh, although the Indo-Pacific concept uh, in the beginning, ASEAN was ambivalent about it. We were not sure where it was going. I think it's work in progress, and, uh, but there are, uh, different, there are four pillars. There's uh, cooperation, there is uh, flexibility in terms of how the cooperation will go about, and so uh, one has to watch how this uh, Indo-Pacific concept will evolve. Uh, in terms of the participation of ASEAN. So uh, more and more, as you watch every day, you will see uh, an evolution of this kind of uh, partnership uh, of the Indo-Pacific area, uh, because uh, people say that the, the Asia is, if you look at the water uh, content of Asia, it's a lot of maritime relationship that keeps us together. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we would like to take the question on uh, the weight of demographics. Uh, Yenju, um, and thank you for the wonderful questions. I, um, and if I may, I'd like to have a very make a quick comments about the AUKUS because um, my suggestion to my government or to my society is we need to join actually to AUKUS as well um, for the pillar two. Not, uh, of course, nuclear power submarine we are very much interested in. However, the enrichment issue remains. Uh, it, it takes another like hours, so I'm gonna skip all those explanations, but absolutely, um, you know, we are interested in um, having a nuclear powered, not again, nuclear armed <laughs> submarine, but uh, rather than that, uh, we are, um, I think uh, my suggestion is we need to join the pillar two of AUKUS uh, against the, all this emerging security issues like a cyber, space, deep ocean, all their things. So, but I'm not representing my whole country. It is pretty, um, again, the polarized society. We have different views about those kind of minilateralism or minilateral framework like AUKUS or Quad. Again, there are many different views about it. And demographic issue, that is fantastic. That is a very sharp question. Uh, because Korea's population is um, shrinking and uh, the speed is the fastest because our birth rate is approximately 1.7. Uh, point, point so it's the lowest in the world. So it is shrinking pretty rapidly. Japan is already shrinking. So Japan, like country, um, again, I'm not representing Japan either, how, I, but I spent many years in Japan and I studied and worked in, over there. But many of my Korean fellow um, citizens, they are worried about the militarization uh, of Japan because we have a traumatic, you know, memories about the uh, uh, fascist imperial uh, Japan. However, because of the demographic issues, I can't think again that Japan can be another like another very offensive player in the region because again, this simply. Self-defense force is difficult to, you know, fill the whole vacancy. Korea too. Our military used to be. Uh, we had um, six hundred thousand, which was uh, the number we have been pretty much proud and confident with for years and years. But not, not any longer. It's hard to maintain. So um, my probably suggestion will be just robotization, AI, all these things should be adopted quickly and extensively because China way, way fast uh, with all this robotization, optimization, or even you know, modernization of the military. That's, that might be my, my answer to you know, the gentleman's question. Uh -huh. Thank you so much. I have a quick question for you, Bates, if I may. Uh, China has been you know, the elephant in the room in this uh, conversation, and, um, and you're a China expert. Uh, very experienced. I, I, I'm just wondering, when you list all these alliances that there are in the region, um, is it an excuse for China to react and to say, look, you know, we have all these enemies, we have 14 countries uh, along our borders, we live in a very dangerous world, and all these countries, they are 
uh, against us. And this is a message that the, you've written a book on this, uh, uh, that the, uh, the Chinese uh, Communist Party is probably uh, um, uh, throwing at people to say, look, uh, you know, we need to uh, rally and, 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 and uh, do you think perhaps these alliances can be somewhat counterproductive because they are uh, raising the stakes and making China either more uh, paranoid or more uh, nationalistic, perhaps? Yeah. I, I recall the statement, I think it was attributed to Henry Kissinger, who said, um, even paranoids have real enemies. Um, and so uh, I, I, I think it's a mix of, of reactions on China's part. Uh, yes, uh, it's an effective instrument of an authoritarian uh, government to uh, instill greater nationalistic uh, pride uh, and even some fear uh, as a way of maintaining some solidarity of population. Um, but at the same time, uh, I also believe that there's, uh, it's not simply a political sort of tactic. Um, the leadership in China today has very serious global ambitions uh, to be a much more uh, powerful, uh, more well-respected, uh, more, uh, more wealthy, and influential player in the international system. In that, in that it is no different from all the rising powers that the students here have studied uh, over, the, over the centuries. Uh, rising powers seek to have a bigger say in how the world works. Um, um, so the, the question is, um, can the international system as it currently exists accommodate uh, in a stable and secure way uh, the ambitions and expectations and dreams uh, that the Chinese leadership and Chinese people have and, and, and believe they deserve uh, to, to achieve. Um, so the answer is how then does the international system, or in particular for the purposes of this panel, the US-led alliance system um, manage that, right? Um, I will say this, Philippe, I think probably w there's lots of reasons for this, but I think there tends to be a default to a military answer, right? How do we, how do we counterbalance and manage China's rise? A lot of governments reach for the military toolbox. Um, there are a lot of reasons for that. It's often quite effective. Um, it is uh, well-funded um, uh, and, and, can, and can be quickly, re relatively quickly introduced, whereas political solutions uh, can be very, very difficult to work out, if not impossible. So I think we, we are at risk, we are definitely at risk of trying to manage uh, the future relationship with China um, primarily through military instruments. I think that's probably not a smart way to go about it and, and, and really raises the risk of, of sort of self-fulfilling uh, outcomes as the two sort of forces um, increasingly fear the other. Well, since this is the Normandy Forum for Peace, we are lucky to have reasonable people at this forum who are not warmongers and reasonable people around this uh, table. So uh, are there more questions? Um, please feel to raise your hand and you can ask in French as well. Uh, we just have to, to warn the panelists, they need to put their headsets uh, on if you're going to speak in French. And please introduce yourself, thank you. Uh, bonjour. bonjour. Good afternoon. I have a question on the relationship between South Korea and Japan because uh, Ms. Lim said that the relationship between Japan and China was improving, but, but I, only see, uh, 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 I only see the improvement 
through K-pop and industrialization. So I can't see if there is a true, I can see how the, that improvement um, is going. How are things improving also between Korea and Japan? Apart, apart from K-pop, we hadn't talked about. Young people, I'm sure, know Korea through K-pop, and I think yeah, you know yeah. it's fair enough. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> please, Yeonjun. Yes, BTS is. Uh, how how can I say? I mean, uh, their closer, um, please, their the, the mic. Oh yeah, their contribution is huge. Um, yeah, of course, the cultural um, impact of um, it was pretty great, even even to the relationship between the Korea and Japan, because Japanese young generation, you know, they have a lot of all this affections to the uh, Korean culture too. The generational transition, I think it is a pretty big key, which is related to the demography issue too. Because our, because I went to Japan um, in 1997, <laughs> right after I graduated from my high school back then, Korea was okay, it was not that super poor country, however, still, relatively speaking, Japan was like this. You know, literally, all infrastructure, services, public services, all the things. Um, so, w I did have some kind of, wow, wow, Japan is like this, it's, uh, you know, much more, how would you say, everything is more convenient, more advanced, da, da, da. But these days, my students, they don't think so. They don't have any that kind of mentality about Japan, because they are so um, comfortable <laughs> with living in Korea, because Korea, everything is so fast, convenient, safe, even though North is threatening us all the time, Berlin's are coming, but uh, you know, still, still relatively speaking, very safe society. So they, um, and even, you know, if you compare the purchasing power parity GDP, um, South Korea's purchasing power parity actually uh, went up there. I mean, you know, it's bigger, higher than even Japan. So what I'm trying to say is all this, um, mentality has changed pretty pretty dramatically over the generations. So as you just pointed out, beyond the just culture, um, how would you say those familiarity or affection, what do we have? That's actually a fundamental question. Um, of course, the leaderships are trying to push forward, but there are still, of course, a lot of backlash uh, from the South Korean, more like a progressive people too. But um, I um, want to remain more optimistic because my, um, you know, student-like generation, young generation in Korea, they have a pretty different view about Japan, and they feel more probably comfortable in communicating with their Japanese counterpart or friends because they don't have any that kind of complex and they feel like closer because we do have common senses. <laughs> we do share common senses. That's a big, big part. Um, as if someone will probably describe that as a cultural thing. Um, you know, the, the behaviorism, if you think about all this behavior, Japanese and Koreans are much more similar than any other probably group in the world. So in that sense, um, I'll see it will, it will take time. However, I think uh, I will certainly expect some more progress. Economically too, uh, it was more like a hierarchical back then, but it's more like a equal now and it's more like a complementary. So Korean company, Japanese companies are trying to make, for example, like consortium-like relationship. Um, they are very much interested in ASEAN, definitely. Um, so all this, um, you know, partnership, they can reach out to the third region, I think. Okay, I, I hope I, I answered, you know, to your question, hopefully. That, that was great, <laughs> thank, you. thank you so much. And it, it, it brings back to me a question I wanted to ask. Uh, Delia, if I may, uh, you, you, you're a great advocate for ASEAN, obviously, uh, having served at, as the Director General, but I'm just wondering from a European point of view and from, from the EU's experience, we haven't spoken too much about uh, Europe here, but that's not, that's not the purpose of this panel, but do you, do you think one day um, Southeast Asians can expect to have an organization that will remotely look like the European Union? Yeah, when ASEAN was born in 1967, uh, there was uh, 
a move to look at models, models for regional cooperation. And certainly, we looked at uh, the EU as a model for uh, a group of countries to work together. After looking closely into what Europe is, Europe is more integrated culturally. Uh, uh, ASEAN is so diverse. And in the beginning, we really didn't know each other very well. Each one of us had a different history. We were an American colony, or before that, a Spanish colony. The Indonesians were a Dutch colony. The uh, Vietnamese, uh, Laos, Cambodia were French colonies. Uh, of course, um, Thailand is very lucky to have had a very strong monarchy that kept away all the others from conquering Thailand. So historically, we, we have such diverse backgrounds. So when we looked at the EU and looked at the word integration, from 1967 to 1992, we were not able to use the word integration. Integration means giving up quite a bit of your uh, political system, uh, economic system, and we were not prepared for the longest time. The first time we thought of integration was 1992 when we made our ASEAN free trade area in order to strengthen our bargaining position vis-a-vis -vis other countries that we were dealing with. In so far as uh, coming out with a, uh, an EU model where you have Brussels, we don't have a Brussels. Most of the decisions are taken nationally and put together. We only have a secretariat in Jakarta. But the real power really remains in the leadership from these countries who work together. And, and this is what uh, makes people a little bit impatient because you have to get consensus from all of these uh, 10 member countries. Uh, last week, we had a meeting of ASEAN foreign min former foreign ministers and we were looking at how do you s strengthen the uh, ASEAN process. I said, well, you know, uh, you don't have an EU passport. I don't think we ever will have, perhaps. Uh, although we compromise, we have an ASEAN lane in each of our immigration offices, which facilitates the travel of a Thai to the Philippines or from Indonesia to Malaysia. And then the second thing that we did was to offer 30 days visa free for all of us. So it's a work in progress. And uh, I said, you know, in uh, some time ago, I don't know, I saw a product made in Europe. So we said, oh, perhaps we should have made in ASEAN so that we will have a trademark. But uh, people were, had reservations about it. So that is the situation with, with ASEAN. But politically, I think we are quite uh, working well together, although we have what you call a very interesting compromise in, in our economic uh, negotiations if everybody does not agree, we will say, all right, 10 minus X, meaning one or two does not agree, but to, to give the, the flavor or the, the kind of impression that we are together, we say 10 minus X. We don't know who that X would be. But uh, it's really a lesson in how to accommodate each other. Sounds like a good idea for the EU. That one or two people, personally, I, would, I wouldn't mind 
living outside sometimes, uh, no names as here. As I said in one of my <laughs> uh, discourse when I was coordinator of ASEAN EU, we want to learn from the mistakes of the EU. So perhaps that's one way to do it. Absolutely. Are there more questions? Please, please raise your, your, your hands. Uh, English, French, yes. Sir, one and two. Why don't we take the two of them, uh, one after the other? Uh, bonjour. Uh, Good afternoon. There was a question. There was a, a question regarding uh, the, the European Union regarding um, ASEAN. I was wondering whether, in the long term, there might be uh, an organization like NATO that could be possible between Japan, um, um, Australia, the United States, and uh, the Asian country. So something similar to NATO. My question will be in English. Uh, I was wondering if it was if there was um, a will to tr for the ASEAN to try to expand. Or is it just trying to stay within these 10 countries? Right. Uh, who wants to take the first question? Uh, Bates? Yeah? My, my name is Bates. Briefly, uh, a question about. You need the mic. Sorry, you need the mic. If I understood the question correctly, it was uh, related to the um, expanding or strengthening relationship between NATO and partners. In the, in the Indo-Pacific region, such as Japan. Um, well, as you would know, uh, there already is underway an effort to try and um, create more regularized, more formalized um, interactions and, and, and uh, ties between uh, Indo-Pacific partners and NATO. I think we've just seen the third year in a row, was it, Philippe, that the uh, leaders of Australia Japan, South Korea, New Zealand, yes. uh, participated, yes. right? As In guests. The, as guests, mm -hmm. observers, or th there's a more formal name for their participation uh, in the annual uh, leadership summit. So, you know, that's a big step. I mean, you consider NATO's uh, 70 years old. It took them this long to create that type of relationship with other, you know, significant partners. But perhaps part of the question was, uh, uh, I mean, this is also, uh, you know, a, a, an issue which uh, uh, people in China have been talking about. Is NATO going to expand towards towards Asia as a, as okay. a sort of global security right. organization, right. Or, or will there be an Asia, yeah. an Asian, Asian NATO. NATO, or something right. like that? I think we can take that in two parts. The answer to the first one is: Is NATO going to expand to Asia? The answer is no. Uh, I highly, highly, highly doubt it. Um, but the second question is, you know, will we see a kind of NATO emerge in the Indo-Pacific region? Again, I, I think the answer to that is probably not. Um, it is a rhetorical instrument that China likes to use uh, in order to uh, vilify, you know, to demonize uh, NATO, or more broadly, to demonize the U.S led alliance system more generally, uh, precisely because it does pose a problem uh, for China's ambitions um, uh, in, in, East East and e in East Asia. But I think it's unlikely. Um, NATO is a quite remarkable organization born of a quite unique history uh, and, and has probably what is you know, one of the most significant sets of, of mutual defense commitments of any treaty, uh, certainly today and maybe even in history, um, to replicate that. Uh, in other words, think of this, uh, an attack on South Korea or an attack on Japan means South Korea will come to Japan's defense. Don't think so. I'd love to hear Yun, Yun Jun's view on this. Yes, um, even though um, we more and more increasingly um, appreciate or recognize the necessity of security cooperation with like-minded country, including Japan, Australia, or even New Zealand, or ASEAN, or even NATO, however, that does not necessarily mean that we need to have a former, as you just, you know, Mr. Gates, uh, Dr. Gates, uh, Dr. Gill, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, as Dr. Gill uh, pointed out, alliance is more based on the real treaty written word with the signature. W 
between Korea, Japan is, is very difficult. Um, it's very difficult. However, I, I think uh, we can deepen uh, the security related cooperation in many different ways and in many different level. But again, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that we're gonna have a former yeah, yeah, alliance. I don't think so either, yes. <laughs> and uh, to the ambassador, what about uh, expansion of ASEAN to uh, new thank members? You. Thank you for reminding me. Uh, actually, <clears throat> for some years now, Timor-Leste, Timor, East Timor, has applied for membership in ASEAN. Uh, however, there are stages where we think uh, they should learn how to become a member or if they qualify in terms of responsibilities that they should take in, in ASEAN. Uh, at the last uh, summit meeting in Jakarta last year, uh, East Timor was accepted as a full-time observer. Uh, there is reason to believe that perhaps uh, next year, when Malaysia takes over as chair, uh, there may be a chance that East Timor becomes the 11th member of ASEAN. But uh, the first uh, official picture that uh, where East Timor appeared, uh, you know, this uh, usual picture of uh, the gentleman and lady uh, holding hands was uh, in uh, uh, the summit meeting in Jakarta last year. And uh, it takes quite a bit of responsibility because you must have enough people to attend all the meetings of ASEAN. You must have the capacity to participate in the uh, activities of ASEAN. Uh, however, we would like, uh, the, the Philippines is one of the countries that uh, would like uh, East Timor to be in. Uh, we have had very good relationship with East Timor, especially during the war they had and uh, uh, East Timor is a Christian country, and they had asked for help from the Philippines because it's a Christian country. So there is some kind of link there. But certainly, we will see 11 soon. But how soon? Perhaps next year when Malaysia takes over as chairman. And meanwhile, there are problems with Myanmar, which is in but sometimes out. You were talking about members occasionally being uh, put on the side. All right, uh, perhaps, is there any more question? Perhaps to, to, to conclude, I would like each of you to say a, a, a few words about how you see the impact. Bates has already mentioned that, but how you see the impact of the US elections, whether it's, it's Harris or, or Trump, how would it, what, what impact would it have on the region? Starting perhaps with you, Dr. Lin. It's a crucial election. Of course, any American presidential election is important to the rest of the world, but this specific election, its impact is going to be huge uh, to the peninsula as well because Kim Jong Un might be waiting for Mr. Trump's, um, you know, coming back to the White House. But we do have both views, and you know, some part, some group of us. Um, want to see more like a sustainability or, you know, path dependent to gain the stability, whereas some others are, you know, looking for any chance, any chance to bring some changes, right, to the, to the stalemate-like situations. Well, but overall, um, as I mentioned during my remark, I think I'm pretty optimistic about at least the relationship between the South Korea and Japan uh, with the new leadership. I, I can be more optimistic. And in general, as far as we share some value and we share some common senses, I think we can work together uh, with Japan and many other you know, like-minded countries in the Indo-Pacific region. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Ambassador, uh, same, same question. Your question reminded me of the visit of Kamala Harris to the Philippines. She was in the Philippines recently, and uh, she wanted to see 
what the problem was. And she stood in an island that was right across another island which uh, China was claiming. So based on the policy statements of uh, President Biden, uh, the word ironclad, I don't know how you translate that in French. Ironclad. If you look at, at the policy statements of uh, Biden and Pamela Harris, Kamala Harris when she came to the Philippines, she repeated the same words of the Philippines a relationship with the United States based on the 1951 treaty agreement. It was one of the first important treaties we have uh, signed with the United States. The relationship is ironclad. Uh, so we have not heard what Mr. Trump has in mind in terms of his policy vis-a-vis -vis Asia. I have, uh, I may have missed it, but I have not seen a strong statement on his policy vis-a-vis -vis Asia. But what I know and what I'm aware of is the strong statement from Kamala Harris on the position of uh, the Democratic Party on the relationship with the Philippines. Thank you, and Bates, uh, same question. I mean, I, I know you, you have to, Just, yeah, I mean, it's tough, but <laughs> what does Trump think about Asia? Right, well, you know, just very quickly, I think you can boil it down quickly that uh, the, the, the future of the alliance system and the traditional ways of the United States has tried to work with them would likely to be sustained and, and, and promoted under a Harris administration. Um, President Trump has already shown us from his previous four years in office uh, that he's gonna be much more transactional and uh, less, I think we can be less certain about um, what those relationships might be. Thank you so much, all three of you, and thank you for your questions.